Welcome everyone. We wanted to let you know you're in the right place with Operation Parents and Beth Tyson this afternoon. We are so excited that you're here to learn with us. Um, we are loading folks uh, into the queue right now and we'd be happy to use this time to also tell you about our next upcoming webinar. We're going to be working with Carrie Stutzman and she's going to be talking to us about how to keep our teens talking to us. So I know as parents, um, we are all anxious to have some good tips and strategies uh, for that. And so come back um, and join us on April the 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, that registration is live. Um, so you're welcome to even maybe pop over and register while we're bringing um, the rest of our attendees into the program with us this afternoon. Um, in case you're brand new, which we do have a lot of new folks joining us today, I wanted to let you know about our mission. Operations Par Operation Parents' mission is to love and support parents by providing real-world information, connection, and most importantly, hope. If I could take just a couple of minutes to introduce you to our system today so that you'll be able to participate. There is an orange grab um, arrow, orange grab tab or an arrow up at the top of your screen. If you'll click on the arrow, you're gonna minimize your screen. But for now, why don't you open that panel all the way up so that you can um, enjoy all the features. We're mostly gonna utilize the question feature today. All attendees are gonna be muted during the presentation. We would, however, love to hear from you via the question section. That's about halfway down the control panel. You're gonna send questions and comments um, via that section. We're gonna answer all of your questions at the end of the um, presentation, or at least um, as many as we can. Please know we might go a, um, a bit over the hour and a half mark with the question and answer segment. But do know that the presentation today will be recorded and sent to you tomorrow. We have put together some awesome handouts for you today. They are um, from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. That one is a really handy conversational tool on um, specific conver conversations to have with a child who is dealing with traumatic grief. We've also utilized two um, great resources from the PACES connection. One is um, titled Parenting for Prevention of ACEs, and the other one is Understanding ACEs. Um, in addition, there is a, a handout of the slide presentation for today. All those are available um, just by downloading while we're here live, or you've also should have received an email uh, just before this presentation. But if you're gonna download them here with us now, just double click um, on the handout the, and there's a little red icon beside each of them and it should download for you automatically. We are um, recording this presentation today and the recording will be sent in an, a follow-up email within uh, 24 hours of the presentation. Please also know that a certificate will be sent in that email. For those of you that are interested in a certificate of attendance, um, that is also gonna be heading your way. The certificate of attendance is gonna be attached to that follow-up email. And um, we uh, look forward to serving you in that way. I'm also gonna ask you to please take time, just a little bit of time. We have a very short survey at the end. Um, it'll take you only about two minutes to complete, and I promise you that we utilize every bit of information um, and feedback that you share with us um, on the survey. Now, um, it's my distinct uh, pleasure to introduce you to Beth Tyson. Um, she is one of the most kind-hearted and compassionate um, professionals that I've had an opportunity to partner up with while working at Operation Parent. She is um, teaching us so much about how she's worked through her own grief and she's using her passion just to help children um, 
get through grief and how those of us adults who want to support children who've had traumatic situations happen to them, how we can be better at that. She gives us very practical, um, great, uh, great um, suggestions, and they're coming straight from the heart. So I'm excited for you to be able to also spend some time and get to know uh, Beth Tyson today. So welcome, Beth. Uh, we're so thankful that you could take the time to put this presentation together for us, and uh, we're looking forward to what we're going to learn today. Thank you for that warm introduction. I'm so happy to be here. So should I just get right into it, and or is there any, I mean, I have um, a couple of announcements. Yes, go ahead and start with your announcements. Um, we're also going to, uh, I'm going to take my camera down, and uh, we're looking forward until you get going. Thanks, okay, Beth. great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar on childhood trauma and loss. I'm Beth Tyson, as um, Michelle so kindly introduced me, and I'm just thrilled to be here with all of you today. Um, we have a very large audience, probably my largest audience ever. Feeling a little nervous, so um, you know, if I make any mistakes, please remember that I am human, just like the rest of us, and that I will do my best to overcome any uh, jitters that I might have. <laughs> so um, a couple of things I wanna announce is that, um, number one, this webinar is for educational purposes only. So during the answer, uh, the question and answer section, if you could please keep your questions rather general. If you have very specific personal questions, we wanna um, save those for a private uh, conversation. So try to keep those questions rather neutral or, or, or general for the general population. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the Facebook page Trauma Informed Parent. Um, Susie DeYoung owns that page and she was so kind to post about this webinar in her Facebook uh, account and on her page. So I just want to give her a shout out and if anybody on this uh, Zoom or call would like to um, follow along with her. She shares a lot of really great content about trauma-informed parenting. I also want to share that, let's see if there's any other announcements I had to make. I think that was, I think that was it. Um, so yeah, so we'll get started today. Well, I also want to point out too that this content can be rather heavy and it could be triggering for some of you folks out there. So if you at any time feel uncomfortable with what I'm sharing or you hear something that's upsetting, um, please know that you're free to leave this presentation at any time. Make sure you reach out to um, somebody in your support network so that you can talk through anything you learned today that might have been upsetting. Um, reach out to a therapist or to a friend or family member that you trust that you can talk to and, and get any type of support that you might need. So um, I'm going to start off our time together today by introducing a little bit more about me. Um, just so you know where I'm coming from, I think it's important when talking about trauma for others to understand that you know that some of these are experiences that I've had in my own life not all of them and certainly not to the extent that some people have experienced trauma but I do have my own experience living through traumatic um, experiences so um, I was inspired by some of those difficult times in my life to become a therapist um, and so that's what brought me here and so as much as those times were painful they also brought me to a new career and a new life and um, new growth and um, being able to share really important information with the world. So I am a trauma survivor. I lost my mom suddenly uh, one night and while she was sleeping. I was about 26 years old and we were very close at that point. We were still, I was practically still living at her house sometimes, <laughs> even though I had my own apartment. And so uh, that was traumatic for me for a couple of reasons. One, because it was so sudden and unexpected. She was very healthy otherwise. And two, because we didn't know why she passed away. No, but we didn't have any, any 
any explanation. So while we waited for an autopsy to be done, we were just panicked about what it could have been, you know, what could have happened. So, um, so those were the two main reasons why that was traumatic for me, but it changed the course of my life and really put me on this path of wanting to help others and give back to my community. I also am the mom to a little girl who is the absolute apple of my eye and teaches me more about life and myself every day than I could ever teach anybody. And I'm also an author of three books now. Um, one is a children's book for grandparents and grandchildren called A Grand Family for Sullivan. And that is a book about kinship families and what it's like and the, the big emotions that come up when a child is being raised by their grandparents. Um, I wrote this book from my direct experience with kinship families or relatives raising their um, other relatives' family, also known as grand families, as I like to call them. And I was working with them as a um, in-home therapist with families who were on the verge of having children removed from their homes because of the, the crises that were taking place and the mental health issues that were untreated. And so I would come in sort of at the, at the last moment, the last case scenario for some of these families and, and do my best to try and stabilize those relationships. And I had a lot of success doing that. And while I was doing that work, I saw just the incredible need for more resources for grandparents who are raising their grandchildren. They are one of the most, if not the most, vulnerable populations in our country. We have about 2.8 million grandparents raising their grandchildren in the United States, and that number is rising every single day due to the opioid epidemic, incarceration, parental death, uh, mental health issues, and just any number of really horrific things. And so um, these families, you know, they need more support than ever. So they inspired me to write this book to help um, to help them understand, help the children understand what was going on in their lives, and help give some language to the to the grandparents and the relatives to talk about some really hard things and about why these children were in their care. At the end of this uh, workshop, we will be giving away three books and three stuffed koala bears to anybody who uh, is here and follows the instructions, but you must be here until the very, very end all the way through the question and answer in order to win. So I hope that um, motivates you to stay and we will get started with the rest of our presentation. So our learning objectives or our goals for this presentation today are number one, to understand the causes, symptoms, and behaviors of children exposed to traumatic experiences. Two, to learn how trauma changes the child's brain and nervous system. And three, to learn trauma-informed relationship skills that will help you support children and teens through hard times. Uh, those are the three main points of our presentation today, and I hope that we fulfill those goals for you. We will start off by talking about adverse childhood experiences because trauma and adverse childhood experiences are kind of two sides of the same coin. They really go together. It's hard to talk about one without talking about the other. Adverse childhood experiences are um, potentially traumatic events that occur during childhood lead to poor outcomes in health and social functioning. There was a huge study done back in 1998 by Kaiser Permanente of about 17,000 people. And what they found was that these early life experiences, these traumatic experiences in a child's life led to poor outcomes in health and social functioning throughout the lifespan. So we saw, um, you know, different events in early childhood really impacting a person's physical health and emotional well being and their social life. And that was sort of groundbreaking back then, although now it's very, this this research is kind of antiquated in a way because there's only three main categories and really there's so many more adversities that could be on this list, but these were the ones that were studied. Doesn't mean that these are the only ones that um, create these outcomes, but these are the examples that were studied in the research. And so we have abuse, which is physical, it could be emotional or sexual. We have neglect, which is um, physical or emotional. And then we have household dysfunction and family dysfunction. So you may have, um, might be having parents with mental illness or somebody close in the family with mental illness, a mother who is being treated violently, 
um, divorce, incarceration of family members, and substance abuse. And those, again, are just the things that were studied, but there are many more other things. I like to explain that the difference between abuse and neglect, um, abuse is something that is happening to the child or doing to the child. Neglect is something where you're withholding something necessary from the child. So you're withholding um, uh, physical safety, you know, you're not providing safety for the child. You're withholding emotional uh, support, withholding emotional enrichment and things like that. We're withholding your love and, at and attention, and that's what's considered neglect. We will be talking a lot about attachment trauma today, and attachment trauma is the focus of this presentation because there's all different types of trauma which you'll see on the next slide but what we are seeing with most of our families who are struggling with raising children in foster care or our grand families or um, children that have been adopted is that there are really a lot of um, children who are experiencing attachment trauma so i'll talk about what that is it's basically um, attachment is kind of a complicated thing to understand and it can get really technical, so I won't give you all those details, but it's definitely something you might want to look up after this webinar. You can simply Google, you know, attachment theory um, and you can look up on websites, even probably on like, um, like Psychology Today or any of those um, psychology focused websites and they will give you a really good description of what that is and you can do some more research, but we will go over how um, it impacts the child and it impacts their, their functioning and their behavior. So you'll see here a couple of bullet points about how it overwhelms an, individual, an individual's ability to cope with stress. It causes feelings of helplessness and intense fear. Um, there's neurobiological changes that actually take place in the child's brain. It can turn off certain genes even, turn off and on certain genes and affect the way they express those genes and which changes the way their brain functions. And there's all the research to back this up as well. Um, it affects the nervous system, making it difficult for children to manage their emotions and their behavior. And it damages the child's sense of trust and safety in the world. So that's that's the thing that I really focus on tonight or today. Sorry, I'm used to presentation presenting at night. Um, but we're going to focus a lot on how to rebuild that trust and safety in the world of a child who doesn't feel safe at all. Um, because these attachment traumas create the belief that close relationships are unsafe. And um, that's pretty much, you know, the the impact that it can have on the children who have experienced these, these types of um, adverse childhood experiences. Here are a few examples of other types of trauma because I just wanted to be comprehensive and not just have everyone assume that there's only this type of trauma. But here's some other examples that might put this into perspective for you. So infants can have can experience trauma. Um, even babies in the womb can experience trauma due to in utero exposure to substances. If the mother is being abused in any way, all those hormones and all those chemicals in the in the mother's body are being passed down to the child in the womb, and so you can even experience trauma in the womb. Um, NICU stays, uh, parent or mental health problems and addiction, separation from caregivers for any reason, uh, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, neglect, witnessing abuse, illness, or medical trauma, divorce, or separation of the parents, or sudden death of a loved one. I talk a lot about infant trauma because we tend to believe, at least in our culture, that infants don't remember these things, that it's not something that they are aware of, or it's not something that will impact them long term. But that is simply not true. Uh, trauma in infancy is probably the most damaging age to, to experience trauma because of how quickly the brain is developing at that time and how the neural pathways are being formed in the brain. So the, you know, those infant years or those, that infant period of time is really, really critical to their mental and wellness and their emotional well-being. So if you have some of these experiences, um, you know, even down to when you were first born, you know, it, it is going to have some impact on you for the rest of your life, likely, unless you get the necessary help and guidance and, and therapy to work through it all. So keep that in mind as, as we go through this, that it can happen, trauma can happen at any age. 
um, school age tra uh, school age trauma. Some typical things would be bullying, um, experiencing natural disasters like floods, and earthquakes, accidents, car accidents, um, any type of violent accident, racism, foster care, or adoption, or you know being removed from your parents for any reason. Um, some teen trauma examples, again, bullying, community violence, intimate, intimate partner violence, and terrorism or shootings in schools and, and things of that nature. Now, these things can happen at all different ages, but these are just some examples to give you an idea of um, events that could be traumatic for a child. So what happens when a child is impacted by trauma? What we know is that when somebody is under an extreme amount of stress, the front part of the brain actually goes offline. And the front part of the brain is called the prefrontal cortex. And that's where all of your decision making and analytical thinking happens. And so when that part shuts down, what happens is the functioning of your brain is activated in the center, like the older part of your brain that is focused on survival. And that's the fear center of your brain. You may have heard it called like the amygdala. And that's where you have, you know, that weaker, or I'm sorry, that that tighter, no, sorry, weaker control of thoughts and emotions and actions. So you're not going to be able to control your reactions. A lot of the way you're reacting is involuntary. And you will um, have a very difficult time managing your emotions because that connection between the thinking brain and like the analytical, logical brain and the connection to the fear center of the brain has been like disconnected. So it's not online. They're not communicating with each other anymore. And that fear is telling the child to run, fight, freeze, or fawn. And fawn is a newer term that we've included in the trauma responses because what fawn is, is it looks like is a child who is very, um, open to people pleasing, is very compliant, is overly well behaved, is very um, on the outside appears to be doing well, but internally they're, they are actually terrified and they're acting that way because they feel as though it will protect them from any type of harm. Um, the fight, flight, and freeze responses also come from that, that older reptilian part of the brain that, um, that senses any threats of danger. And so when that sensor goes off and says, oh my gosh, we're in danger, I need to do something, it's either going to be run, fight, or flight, or freeze, because um, those are the things that will keep you alive. And those are the things that kept people alive millions of years ago. If an animal was attacking them, or if there was some other type of direct threat to their safety, those were the th three things that kept us alive. And so we've passed those traits and those characteristics down throughout the generations. Um, but now in our world, we don't have tigers and bears coming after us. We have you know, different types of threats that are scary to us. So um, some of those reactions that you can have are involuntary and they are not the child's fault. It is not their, it's not in their control the way that they're reacting to these experiences. And I like to make a real clear point of that because, um, you know, oftentimes a child gets blamed or punished, but really there is a very lack of control over these, these um, responses. So here is just the graphic of some things that you might notice if a child is struggling with um, any type of trauma. So those are, those are some of the main things that you'll notice. A lot of anxiety or numbing out or avoidance, not having memories of what happened, um, using substances, eating disorders, panic attacks, nightmares, you know, all, all of these things are, are common and they are actually a, not, a normal adaptive response to trauma. Why do we see all of these challenging behaviors? Well, there's several reasons, and of course, this isn't all of them. I'm sure there's more, but these are the main ones that I see with the families that I worked with. Children tend to repeat what's familiar to them. So if a child grew up in a home that was very chaotic and there was a lot of yelling and fighting and screaming all the time, and they are removed from that home, and they are now living in a home that's very peaceful and quiet and calm, even though as an adult, we would say, well, they're okay now. They're safe now. Shouldn't they be behaving better? Shouldn't they be um, 
shouldn't they be calmer? What's going on? What am I doing wrong? Well, it's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's that the environment is so different than what they're used to that what they're trying to do is create what is familiar to them. So by being disruptive, by causing trouble, by getting into trouble and all these things and arguments, they are trying to repeat what's familiar to them. And so that's something that we see happen with a lot of the families that I worked with, um, especially the kinship families. Um, I know that's a big struggle struggle for them to understand, but it makes sense if you think about the fact that familiarity equals safety for children and for adults too. And so anything that feels familiar is going to feel safe, even if it's unhealthy, even if it's hurtful. They've also learned that close relationships can equal danger. So the people who were supposed to love and protect them most in the world have harmed them. And the reality of that is excruciatingly painful. And so what are you going to do if you've been hurt by someone who's supposed to be the person that protects you and loves and cares for you? You're going to associate any relationship as a danger because if those people can't love and protect you, how can anybody else? And so they make these associations early in life and it becomes very difficult for them to trust and have um, to feel safe and trust and relax in relationship with others. They also have a fear of being rejected. So if you had a parent who is who's who abandoned you or some other figure in your life that has left, um, it you don't like how that feels. It's hurtful. It's painful. So what do, what do humans do? We avoid that type of pain. So by not getting attached to anybody, we can we can prevent ourselves from experiencing more hurt. And so that fear of being rejected can keep children um, from behaving and acting in a way that would be um, pleasing to us because then there's a fear that if they do that, they may get too close to somebody and they may actually develop a relationship with that person. And that's terrifying to them. Negative attention can distract them from their emotions. So if you're getting in trouble all the time and everyone's mad at you all the time, there's really no time to feel sadness or despair because you're, you know, you're always in this drama situation and, and um, anger is another way to deflect your feelings of sadness or fear. So, um, you know, a lot of these children end up getting in trouble a lot and having behavior problems or aggression. And the reason they do that is because it's, it distracts them from what their true emotion is, which is sadness or fear. Um, so that decision-making portion of the brain is not functioning properly. It's in that fear state. As you can tell, all of these examples are basically the brain sensing danger and not really being able to analyze or assess like what's safe and what's not. And so even when they're with somebody who's safe, because that decision-making portion of the brain is not connected to the fear center of the, of the brain, they are unable to recognize that like, oh no, no, this person is a safe person. They can't trust, they can't trust because they're stuck in that fear seat. They also have a valid need to release their rage. So if you're seeing a lot of aggressive behavior and acting out, I mean, let's be honest, what these children have been through <laughs> is valid of, you know, ex of expressing rage. Um, nobody deserves to be treated the way they've been treated. And so there is a lot of underlying anger and rage that needs to come out. The trouble is they need to be able to do it with a safe adult and within a safe environment in a way to express themselves that doesn't harm anybody else or themselves. On this slide, I like to explain these different states of arousal um, because it can help us really understand if we look at this chart where a child is in their mindset. And once we know where they are in their mindset, once we know if they're in that fear state or if they're in the green state, which is like a safe state, or if they're in the blue state, which is like a shutdown state, um, then we can know how to respond to them. If we don't know where they are on this diagram, then it can be really difficult to know what our response to them should be. So I will go through this. It's a little bit technical, so bear with me, and <laughs> hopefully I can explain it clearly so that you can all understand it. Um, feel free to ask questions at the end about this if anything doesn't make sense. So. This is called the Yerkes Dodson model of arousal, and it was actually created a long time ago, back in 1908. And what they did was they tested out mice and to see to see how productive they could be, and 
basically what they did was they stressed the mouse and with little electrical shocks. And what they found was that a little bit of stress or like a moderate amount of stress motivated the mice. They, it motivated them to go after the cheese and to work their way through the, mu the maze. However, once they kept turning up the stress and maybe giving them a little bit too much stress and uh, too much of a shock, I know this sounds very cruel to animals and I apologize, um, but what they found was that the productivity and the ability for that mouse to make decisions and to actually engage in um, finding the cheese dramatically reduced and dropped off exponentially um, thereafter. So the way I like to explain this in an everyday example is that in the blue zone, that might be like when you first are kind of waking up in the morning, you're kind of half asleep, you're still groggy, you're not really you're not really like able to make sense of what's going on around you. You might not be able to form your full sentence yet. And that's kind of like that blue area where you're you're more under aroused. This is your, your hypo arousal, low arousal state, low stress, low stimulation. As you go through the day, uh, you get ready, you have some coffee, you have some breakfast, um, you know, you're on your way to work, you're listening to your favorite song on the radio, you feel calm, you feel focused, you feel peaceful, ready to take on the day, you're not feeling a lot of stress, um, just enough, you know, you're feeling a little bit of stress because you're going to work and you have things you need to do that day and accomplish that day, but you're not overwhelmed by it. You're, you're like ready for it. That's that green state and that's where we want most of these, we want to work on having children spend more time in this green zone so that they're not constantly overwhelmed. Um, and so then as you're, as you're um, driving to work, there's traffic, you hit a traffic and you're gonna be late. Well, now your anxiety starts to go up, right? And the longer you sit in traffic, the more and more aroused you're getting, the more angry you might be getting, the more frustrated, scared, nervous, because you have this big important thing you're doing today that you were excited about, but now you might be late for it and the whole thing might be ruined. Not only that, but you look bad in front of your employees or your boss. And so now you're in that overwhelmed state. You're not thinking as clearly. You might, um, you know, flip off somebody next to you in the car or, you know, lose your temper on somebody or you may cry or, you know, you're, you're not functioning at your optimal level anymore because of the stress that you're under. And what I like to explain is that most of the time, children that have experienced trauma are living in this orange area um, of just hyper arousal. So they're over aroused, they're too scared, they're too stressed. They're thinking about when am I gonna see my mom again? Uh, where am I sleeping tonight? You know, who, am I safe? Who can I trust? Um, you know, when am I gonna see my siblings again? You know, there's all these questions and no answers a lot of the times, or at least no clear answers. And oftentimes, they're being promised things that never happen. So there's a lot of times their trust has been broken. So there's just no time for the brain to really relax and be in that green zone. And so when you're in that green zone, the productivity and your ab ability to make decisions and your ability to follow directions, your ability to learn and to do things um, that are productive in life drops off and you actually are not able to anymore to function in that way, in that optimal way. And so what we want to do and what I'll help you do tonight or today is to help you shift, help you find activities and things you can do to shift the child into that green zone more often. One of the types of trauma that impact the populations I'm speaking about um, is called ambiguous loss. And this might be a new term for a lot of you, so we'll go over what that is. But ambiguous loss is a very common experience, especially for children that are in foster kinship or adoptive families, um, families of divorce and families who have uh, parents in the military or have very demanding jobs when they're not home a lot. You know, all these situations are everyday types of situations that can bring up what's called ambiguous loss, which can be traumatic for some children. Um, so here are some examples, you know, moving to a new community. And ambiguous means like something that just doesn't have any clear boundaries. So with typical or, or traditional, or I don't know what, natural, I guess you'd call it, natural death uh, of like, you know, of, of a person's life, there's, there's a clear ending to that although there might not be any closure about it, there's always an ending. 
and it's a final thing. Whereas in divorce, it's not exactly final. There's a loss, but the loss continues because your parents are still in your life and you long to be with one when you're with the other. And there's a lot of like uncertainty and back and forth. And, um, you know, I experienced this in my own life as a child who grew up with um, parents who were divorced, where I would, you know, um, have to travel long distances to see one or the other and be separated from them for extended periods of time. And that was really difficult for me. And it was a type of loss, although it wasn't acknowledged at the time. These aren't things that people really knew about back then. Um, But I was in a constant state of loss and grief because I couldn't be with my loved ones the way that I wanted to be. And, um, and so that's an example of an ambiguous loss that just kind of goes on and on without any finalization or clear ending. We can go to the next slide. Sorry. So there's two main types of ambiguous loss. One is a physical absence with a psychological presence, and the other one is a psychological absence with a physical presence. So in type one, examples would be foster care, kinship care, and adoption, incarceration, the military, any situation where the parent is physically absent, but still psychologically present. So the child is still thinking of this person, still loving this person. There's still a hope of having some kind of relationship with this person, but the person themselves, they're alive on earth, but they're not present in the child's life and in a physical way. They're not there to pick them up from school. They're not there to put them at bed at night. They're not there physically, but psychologically, yes, they are there because they're just not reachable for some reason. Um, Type two is a psychological absence with physical presence. So uh, this would be people with addiction, severe grief, depression, or preoccupation with romantic relationships as some um, typical examples. So those are situations where the parent is physically there, physically in the home. They can see them, um, but psychologically they're somewhere else. They're focused on their relationships or they are focused on their substance use, or maybe they're grieving the loss of another um, loved one, or maybe they have mental health issues that are unaddressed. So the parent is there every day, but mentally they're, they're not present with the child. And this is another type of loss. So why does this this type of loss matter? Why does this trauma matter? Well, it can lead to PTSD, anxiety, or depression. It's often overlooked as an explanation for child behavior. So especially for teachers and those in the community um, and parents too, that you have a child and you notice all these behaviors coming up and yet you don't know what's wrong or what's going on. You can't really pinpoint what it could be. Well, this is one thing that you can at least assess for and sort of rule out because it's so common. There's so many different types of loss that happen, especially now with the pandemic, we saw tons of new losses that we'd never experienced before. Ambiguous losses such as, you know, the loss of ceremonies like graduation, the loss of um, rituals and and celebrations like weddings and funerals. We lost um, time with our, our family members. We weren't able to attend different you know, events throughout the year and holidays. So those were all ambiguous losses for our children. And we wonder why they're struggling so much. And it's because they're grieving. They're really grieving all the things that they lost over the last two and a half years. I think we all are. Um, So mental and physical health problems can also arise from this experience of ambiguous loss and uh, relationships come in pair sorry, impaired, and there's just really no place for the mind to rest. Like, it's just a state of complete frozen grief or what we call grief limbo, where you're just in between, you're just uncertain. You just don't know what's going to happen. There's no clear answers. And that can be incredibly stressful and taxing to a child's mind to always have to be wondering and worrying about these big questions about their life. So I always encourage people to just check for ambiguous loss to rule out as a cause for behavioral challenges. So there's some relationship problems that come up with ambiguous loss, such as family conflict and like family roles changing. So where you might have been the middle child in a family, if there is some sort of separation and you are now in a home 
uh, in a foster family and now you're the oldest child, that's a totally different role than the middle child has ever experienced. Or maybe you go from being the baby in the family to being the oldest in the family. Um, and so these changes of roles can be a huge source of stress and conflict because the expectations are different. So if a child was you know, the youngest in one family and then moves to another and is in a different role or maybe the oldest, that parent might be expecting things from the child that the child just isn't used to doing. Um, the same thing if they were the oldest and they were parentified, which means they were like primarily the one that was taking care of the other children in the home. Well, then they go to another home where they have a healthy caregiver taking care of the children. But the child being so used to being in that parent type role feels lost. They're like, what do you mean I'm not the one in charge here? You know, what do you mean I'm not the one that is responsible for taking care of these children and, and you know, reprimanding them or disciplining them? You know, that might have been really part of their job and their purpose in life. And now they no longer have that role because they're in a foster home or a kinship home where there is a healthy parent or caregiver. And so they don't know what to do. And that conflict between the parent or the caregiver and the child can be really um, really extreme. So it's important to help and try and integrate, you know, if you have that situation, there's things that you can do to, you know, let them have a little bit of ownership of that role. Let them, you know, let them do a, a couple of the responsible things and kind of include them in those conversations to just help them um, feel normal and feel familiar in your family. There might be the ending of family rituals or celebrations. Um, there might be mistrust of caregivers or professionals, and the child may avoid relationships and push people away just because it's, it again, feels too painful to get close to anybody because you just don't know if that person's going to be there for you or not. The good news is there is power in your relationship. A children, and this is research done by Harvard University, extensive research, that children only need one consisting, consistent, loving adult in their life to cope with adversity. The more healthy relationships a child has, the better off they will be, but at least one person is all they need to be able to trust and have consistent relationship with. This will provide them the comfort and reduce the likelihood of mental health problems. So be that one person they can trust. The reason I say that is that especially for children impacted by trauma, that is what they have lost. They have lost the sense of trust in the world and the people around them, and it's not fair, and they didn't deserve it. So please be that one person that they know that they can ask you anything and you will tell them the truth, even if it's hard, even if it hurts, even if it's painful. Of course, it needs to be age appropriate, so get guidance and coaching or you, through a therapist if it's a really difficult topic find those words read the books that can say it better than any of us can say but just do what you have to do to be as honest with them as you can you're going to hear me repeat that a lot throughout this presentation because adults myself included out of good intentions and well-meaning you know and out of out of not wanting to hurt or do more harm to children we sometimes tell fibs or we fudge the truth or we leave parts out or we do these things and then the problem is that when they find out later on when they're adults or whenever it is down the road the truth about their lives now they realize they couldn't even trust you and so now their trust has been broken yet again and it is very hard to recover from that so please be that person that they can trust. So helping teens through these situations, the first thing we want to do is acknowledge these losses. Because oftentimes, if it's not a death, we don't acknowledge it. That's just how our culture is. We don't have a way to acknowledge, um, you know, miscarriages or um, or these other types of losses that I've mentioned tonight, um, because it's just not part of our our culture to acknowledge it. In fact, none of us really like to acknowledge loss and death. We turn away and run from it most of the time. But you really have to acknowledge the loss because they're thinking about it anyway. And if you think they're not, unfortunately, it's not the truth. They are thinking about these losses all the time and you bringing it up isn't doing any more harm. You bringing it up is validating their experience and is going to help them process through what they've experienced and gone through. And they 
will be heard and seen and known. And isn't that what all of us want really at the end of the day is just for one other person in this world to really see and hear us and to feel what we're feeling or at least to acknowledge what we're feeling if they can't feel it. So if you see, um, if you can make the correlation between a child's behavior and, and loss, then point it out, say, you know, I wonder if you're feeling really angry because you're missing your dad. And provide that opening for them to talk about it and to express something, to let a little bit of a little bit of steam out of the pot. And you'll be surprised with what you might get, you know, maybe the first time you won't get much, but if you keep kind of gently, you know, sprinkling in there and opening up the opportunity to talk about it, you can really make a lot of progress. Normalizing ambiguity, ambiguity is also important. So sharing your experiences of these different types of loss and pointing them out in everyday life, you know, even simple things like going to work every day. For younger children, you can really point this out as a type of uh, ambiguous loss is like, you know, yeah, you have to go to school all day and I have to go to work all day and I really want to be with you. I really miss you, but I can't, we can't be together. And that's really tough. Um, I want to be two places at the same time. I want to be with you and I want to, I want to be um, at work too, because I need to do those things. And that's a type of ambiguous loss as well. So pointing out these daily experiences can be helpful just to normalize the situation and let them know that they're not the only ones who feel this way. If you don't understand what the child is going through and you maybe you think it's ridiculous or they need to just grow up or buck up or, you know, stop being a, a wimp or whatever it is, don't, that's not going to help. It's better to be empathetic and to really try and be there to understand what the child's going through, even if you don't get it. You know, even if it's like they lost some toy that you think is not that important. Well, it's important to them. So just even if you can't agree with it, at least just reflecting to them, you know, you're really sad that you lost X, Y, Z. That's all. You don't have to, you know, get on the bandwagon and start crying with them or really, you know, get into it. You can stay pretty neutral, but just observe and point out like, oh, you must, I think you're really upset that you lost such and such. Active listening and validating the grief. It's its normal to feel sad about your brother leaving for college. That's another one. I, you know, I went through that. My brother moved away. Um, once he went uh, overseas to study abroad when I was in college, or I was in high school, he was in college. And man, that was hard. That was the first time that him and I had really been separated for any a length of time. It was really sad. And it was, it was, it brought up a lot of feelings of loss in me, even though I knew he was coming back. It was that first big separation for us. And um, so these things can, can trigger a child's trauma and grief and loss. And so it's important to keep an eye out for these things. If you have, I know this is a little bit of a different topic, but so with foster and kinship and adoptive families, oftentimes the teen is hearing, has at that point of being a teen, has probably heard lots of stories about their birth family and about mom and dad and probably a lot of negative stories, unfortunately. I saw this happen so many times in my work where I'd be in home with a family doing therapy with the parent or the caregiver, the foster parent, and they would just be trash talking mom and dad. Sure, little Bobby's out of the room, out of eyesight, but he's right in the next room. He can hear everything we're saying, you know, and I would always, you know, try and tamper down the conversation. Like, let's talk about that later. I talk to you about that when Bobby's not around, you know, I try to explain to them why, but for some reason, we still kind of think that children aren't listening. Well, they are, they are listening. They do hear you. They hear everything. They are little sponges who are soaking up everything we say, whether we like it or not. Believe me, I wish my child was not so spongy. <laughs> she hears everything. Um, so please try and be as positive. And if you can't be positive about birth family or their original, um, or, you know, their mom and dad, their, or their origin family, please try to be neutral. So if you can't find anything positive to say, at least stay neutral and acknowledge um, that person in their life and for the importance that they have, no matter how cruel or how terrible um, a parent was to a child, there is an instinctual bond that happens between parents and children that never goes away. And so if you are just ignoring that person and pretending that person doesn't exist, that is going to be very painful for the child. And if you are bad mouthing or talking negatively about that person, 
that's also going to be damaging to the child. So try to find something positive. I like to say like, if you can't, say you don't know the family, say you don't know the birth parents at all, you could still point out, wow, you know, you have the most beautiful eyes. Maybe you got your eyes from your mom or your dad. I bet you they had really pretty eyes. You know, even though it's something superficial, it's just something like that has to do with the outside. It's still nice to hear, you know, like your, your parent mentioned. Um, or it could be something internal like, wow, you have such a great sense of humor. I bet you got that from your grandfather. Or I bet you got that from your uncle or your dad or whoever it might be who's missing. Just to kind of like point out like, yes, you have a history that I really don't know anything about, but I'm willing to acknowledge it for you. That can, sh that can really help build trust and build a bond between the two of you um, that you wouldn't have otherwise. I had one client who um, knew, we knew nothing about, actually, I don't think it was my client but it was so long ago. I think it was a colleague of mine's client uh, who the child had no information about their parents other than the place that she was born so that she knew that she was born in such and such hospital. Um, so the caseworker, not the caseworker, the therapist took the child to see the hospital where she was born because it was thankfully close enough that they could go and drive by and visit it and take pictures. And it was the only thing that she had, but it really was grounding for her and gave her a sense of identity. Like, at least I know where I was born. At least I know where my life started. So be on the lookout for opportunities like that where you can be creative and come up with workarounds and solutions if you don't have any other information about the person's family. As always, please tell the truth in age appropriate terms. Like I talked about earlier, um, you know, mom is not able to keep you safe right now. She's working on learning how to keep you safe is a great script to use for children who maybe um, have moms or dads who are dealing with substance abuse or, it, or are in treatment for substance abuse. So how do we, help teens through this even more? How do we help them find meaning in their experiences? Well, we increase their tolerance for ambi ambiguity. That is one of the hardest words to say. <laughs> um, we try to increase their tolerance for change and for uncertainty. We don't shelter them from all adversity. I am a product in, of this. Uh, I've tried to do this in my daughter's life and I'm only learning now that she's six years old that I really have to let her experience some more uh, tough times in her life so that she knows what to do when tough times come along. If we shelter our children too much and we don't let anything ever happen to them, we don't let them feel any stress. As you'll remember back on that graph, the Mindset Mountain, we do need some stress, right? In order to be in the green zone, we need a mild to moderate amount of stress to, to get motivated to do things in life. So some stress is okay for children. They need, they need to feel a little bit of pressure in life and they need to face some hard times so that when they do face something bigger, they've had like a buildup to it. It's kind of like, um, you know, like the desensitization process. Like if you've never had any adversity or loss in your life, and then all of a sudden something major happens and you lose a parent, well, you're gonna have a much harder time coping with that than if you had had some exposures to smaller losses along the way. It's just one example. I don't expect the child to get over it or find closure. In fact, with death, even with like final death, like of a person's life, there's still not exactly closure. You might um, mature in your grief, but there's never really closure. That psychological relationship continues on and should be encouraged to be continued on um, for children and adults. For example, with my mom, I still have a psychological, you know, spiritual relationship with her in my mind, even though she's not physically here. And so I don't call my relationship with her closed or ended. Um, it's a continuation. It's just in a different realm. It's in a different form. It's, it's more psychological and emotional and spiritual instead of physical, but it's still there. Um, over time, help them find meaning in their loss. So, of course, this isn't something you do right away, but it is important along the way over time if they've had time to work through and process their loss and their grief and their trauma through therapy or through relationships to maybe start considering giving back to others in their situation. That can be incredibly powerful. Um, starting a support group or offering support groups at school for these different topics is, could be really helpful to children in the community. Um, volunteering for a nonprofit who supports families uh, who are struggling with some of the things they went through. All these things can, can help them find meaning and say, you know, even though I went through these really awful things, there is, I can put my finger on a few good things that came out of it in the long run. 
Here are some other ideas. We'll just kind of run down these. You can look these up online too. If I, I don't think I have time to go into each and everything. Um, memory boxes is really simple. It's just like a box full of memories. Life books are something we see a lot in the fo uh, foster care system. Basically a timeline and a journal, like a visual journal of a child's life. Um, this is really important if you have children in care because, or if you're a foster parent because, um, they may forget where they were due to the number of moves that they've experienced. So if you have a child and it's early on in their in their time and, and care, I'd say start a life book for them. It's one of the best things you can do. Offer journaling to them. Time with plants and animals can be incredibly healing um, and feel safer than relationships with people. It can be a stepping stone to attachment and, and healthier relationships. Um, painting memory rocks and placing them somewhere around your property is like a little little um, moments that they can go and kind of visit the rocks and think about their their loved ones. Uh, lighting a candle and other rituals at birthdays or holidays, of course, ask the child if they want that representation of their family members there. But, um, you know, that is something that I always try to incorporate my mother's memory into the different holidays that we do through rituals. And then finding long-term mentors. It's important that they're long-term. Because of the loss, we don't want to um, trigger the child's loss again by losing a relationship with a mentor too soon. So make sure if you do um, engage in a mentorship program for a child that it's a long-term mentoring situation. So what makes it harder? Um, expecting children not to think about these problems, as I mentioned earlier, they are thinking about it. Um, ignoring it or just pretending that it's not there is not helpful and does more harm than good. So um, also children will tend to make up stories if they don't know the truth. So really, again, making up, telling them the truth is probably better than what they're expecting in their mind. Um, oftentimes we jump to the worst case scenario when we don't have answers and children do the same thing. They can make up wild stories. <laughs> they have wild imaginations. I've heard some crazy things over the years. So I think that is another reason why it's okay to bring it up. I know it's hard, but you're going to be helping the child. Expecting children to come to you to discuss it, it's not going to happen. Um, shaming children for their grief, like, you know, stop crying. Big kids don't cry. Big girls don't cry. Or, or comparing them to other children. Why can't you be like your sister? She just moved too. She's not upset. You know, those, those things, although they tend to roll off the tongue because they probably said to us, they just aren't helpful and they can do harm. Denying and mis minimizing their feelings. So, oh, get over it. It was just a pet, you know, say that a pet runs away. Or your mom was never there for you anyway. Or everything happens for a reason. You know, that's like that toxic positivity thing where you just keep like telling the child to think positive, think positive, think positive. Well, that's not going to help if you don't feel positive. Um, and if, you, if your life feels like it's in chaos, you know, just trying to focus on the positive isn't going to work. What makes it, uh, I'm sorry, I can't see over my picture. Let's see if I can move this out. What makes it harder? Um, trauma responses are um, sometimes elicited from the following things for children that have experienced grief and loss. Um, silence, so again, not talking about it. Secrets, not telling the truth about it. Additional separations, uh, that's a big one. So that can be a huge trigger for kids that are um, that have experienced trauma um, or loss of any type. Toxic positivity, which I just mentioned a moment ago, which is just like trying to look on the bright side of everything. Well, they need their they need their anger validated and acknowledged. They need their sadness validated and acknowledged. It's okay to feel the full range of emotions. All humans have the full range of emotions. And in fact, the healthiest humans are able to feel all of them and cope with them appropriately. So it's not that you need to be happy all the time. Nobody's happy all the time. That's an unrealistic expectation. We have to um, make room and make space for all of the human emotions. They're normal. There's a purpose for all of them, and they deserve the same amount of respect as happiness or joy. Lack of trust with new caregivers. Um, so again, not being a trustworthy, consistent, reliable person is, is going to likely trigger them and be harmful. And dishonest explanations, not telling the truth. And yes, so those are like the main things that will definitely make things harder for you and the child. The role of trust, 
Um, one trustworthy and consistent attachment relationship can be a corrective emotional experience for a child. So basically what that means is that we have the opportunity. This is where the hope is. And we talked a little bit about this earlier, but what happens is when you are that person that they can trust and that is there for them, you're correcting a previous hurt or pain or belief system that was set up. So when you break that belief that everybody will hurt them, when you break the belief that everybody will let them down, when you break the belief that everybody will lie to them, what you are doing is providing them with that corrective emotional experience, which they need in order to heal. So that's why this is so important that to be that person for them. It can be, re this trust that they've lost can be reestablished over time. It's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen from one corrective emotional experience. It's going to take time and you must be patient. But if you are consistently over and over again as much as possible, of course, for humans, we will make mistakes and no parent or caregiver is gonna get it right every time. But if you can at least shift that ratio to a larger portion of the time, then you can regain and rebuild that trust with the child. Um, and that will break that cycle of trauma from repeating itself over and over again, which we see a lot of families kind of get stuck in. And the child's brain is, it's important to know the child's brain, especially young children's brains, are more malleable, changeable, flexible, adaptable than adult brains. And so the reason this is so important is because the earlier we provide treatment for the trauma, the better. I don't care how early, the earliest possible time is when you want to in intervene, even if they're functioning fine, even if they're getting good grades, even if they're behaving in the home, if there has been a trauma, they need treatment yesterday. They need it immediately. They need it now, not when you start to see symptoms. That's reactive. We want to be preventative. So please, if there's been a trauma, do not wait, do not sit on it until it becomes a problem. Get them the help they need now and never give up. There's always hope for change. So how do we build that trust? A few more, a few more things to talk about. Um, I love this little cartoon or, or caricature drawing um, illustration, I guess is the right word. It is just, oh my gosh, it's, it makes me tear up almost every time I read it. So I will read it and bear with me. Um, it says, I'm afraid, said Rabbit. What are you afraid of, asked Bear? I don't know, replied Rabbit, I just am. Then I will sit with you until you're not afraid anymore, said Bear. We will face it together. That's all any of us really want in this world, is to have someone to face it with together and to know that no matter what we feel or what we go through, that that person is going to be there by our side. They don't have to fix it. They don't have to distract us. They don't have to make us laugh. They don't have to do anything but be present. And these repetitive, consistent relationships are what heal. Now, one way, and this is a huge, huge thing. So listen up if you've, if you've gotten bored of <laughs> listening to me talk for the last hour. This I want you to really listen to. It's about triggers. And the reason we're talking about this now is because if you can point out and locate some triggers, both for yourself and for the child, you will be able to build some trust because you'll be able to anticipate what might be coming down the pike and prepare ahead of time for it. And that will help you build trust um, with the child. So understanding triggers. What's a trigger? A trigger is anything in a person's environment. It's usually sensory information, such as sights, sounds, uh, smells, tastes, touch, feelings, all these different things in your sensory experience that tip off the brain to danger. So they turn on that alert system and says, woo, 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 danger, 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 danger. We got to do something. We got to run. We got to fight. We got to fight. We got to freeze. We got to do something. We got to get out of here. We got to hurt somebody. Um, you know, that is what is happening in the child's brain when they are triggered. These triggers can be unconscious a lot of times. So that's where the real difficulty comes in. When they're unconscious and we don't know about them, 
If we can't identify them, then we can't change our situation to do anything about it. However, if you can at least be aware and view the child through a lens of of, okay, this, tra this child has experienced trauma, so I know there's going to be triggers. Has there been a trigger? Maybe there's been a trigger. It can help adults stay calm in a moment when the child is really dysregulated and really misbehaving or throwing a tantrum or being aggressive or shutting down, whatever it may be, we can say, okay, there must have been a trigger. This has nothing to do with me. And when we take it off of ourselves as the cause if they, when we take away the fact that it's us that's done something wrong or you know self-blaming ourselves and we can have more empathy for the child so we want to try and locate so they're not all unconscious some of them are but if we can locate triggers ahead of time we can help prepare you and the child for the emotions they will experience those triggers can occur at any time of year but they're more likely in settings that remind the child of traumatic events or loss so here is a tool that I developed. It's called uh, a trigger map. And what it is, is just the four seasons of the year broken out into uh, pieces of a pie. And I think this is one of the handouts that we provided. What I want you to do is print this out and use it for yourselves and for your children. Um, so basically you just go around the circle and you think about all the different times of year and what might have happened that was traumatic during those times. Um, was there an abuse? Was there a loss? Was there a removal? Was there a death? Was there, um, did they witness something? Was there, it could be many different things. All the traumas I listed, was there an accident? Was there a natural disaster? You know that around that time of year, they're going to be triggered because of the sights, sounds, and smells that go, around, go along with the, each of the seasons. For example, if you had a trauma in the winter, a child could be triggered by something as simple as Christmas music, or the smell of uh, fire burning in a chimney, or um, the sights of Christmas lights on a tree. It could be anything, but if it tips off the brain to remind them of something that happened during that time of year, then um, you're going to notice a lot more reactivity, a lot more dysregulation in their behavior, and a lot more problems in your relationship. The good news is you can, knowing this, you can be preventative. You can kind of brace yourself, get yourself a lot of support uh, prior to this season. So if you know the fall, if, if there wasn't any trauma in the fall, but you know there was a lot of, that there was a trauma in the winter, during the fall, you know, you wanna, you wanna be in therapy. You wanna be, you want the child to be in therapy, um, maybe even, you know, in the summer and the fall. Um, to help them, you know, cope with what they're about to go into and hopefully bring down some of those responses to the triggers they're going to experience. Um, you want to make sure that they're getting lots of rest, that, you know, maybe seeing 100 family members from uh, the middle of December to the end of December is not going to be a great idea for your child. You need to put their priorities first. And if that's the case, you know, maybe seeing all these people is, is not going to be helpful for them because it's triggering in some way. So, you know, you really have to think about the way you live your life. And I'm not saying that you have to tiptoe or change everything, but in certain situations that are really important, you can mitigate some of the impact of the triggers by um, making different choices, by preparing yourselves ahead of time with a lot of self-care and a lot of support uh, and things of that nature. I hope that makes sense. If you guys have any questions about the trigger map, please um, ask them during the question and answer section. I'll be happy to answer them for you. So what can we do? Well, I've given you quite a bit of, of things that we can do, but I think we have a few more things. So we'll talk about this. Um, this is called the CARES model, something I also developed. And it stands for consent, accept, reflect, um, I think explain and share, I forget, or maybe it's, no, empathy and sharing. So consent, which means, um, okay, thank you, educate and empathy. Uh, <laughs> um, so consent is, 
is yes means yes. Now, not all children can consent, right? If they've if they've been abused, you know, they may be too fearful to say no. So there's not always an opportunity for consent. However, you can at least try. You can approach slowly. Um, you cannot touch the child unless they give you permission. You know, not don't don't assume that every child wants a hug or wants you to sit closely to them when they're upset. For some, that might be triggering because somebody was too close in their personal space and something terrible happened. So don't assume that all children want hugs. Assume that, you know, unless they say otherwise, you know, keep a personal distance um, unless you ask them for that permission. Um, have a receptive stance and facial expression with your hands open, your chest open, um, you know, speak to them with a soft, caring voice, your tone of voice. Kids are like little detectors of tone of voice they know if you're safe or not just by the, the sound of your voice so you know really trying to talk to them and be authentic and genuine um, asking them if it's okay or do you need something else right now um, if no give them space but stay nearby and always have a safety plan in place so have a backup person in case the child um, becomes too aggressive with you that you can call right away and like always have them on speed dial and let them know like you're my safety person if something goes wrong i'm gonna call you and it's an emergency like i need you to drop everything and um, I know not everybody's going to have that person, and that breaks my heart. But if you can have that, have somebody like that as your backup. Um, accept the child's feelings and their experiences, no matter what. Let the feelings run their course. Stay present and calm, just like the bear did with the rabbit. You just have to be there. You don't have to solve, distract, fix. Just just sit and just wait it out with them as long as they're safe as long as they're not hurting you or someone else um, one thing you can do is keep pillows in the rooms of the house or nearby or even in the classroom always have pillows nearby just in case you need to protect yourself from a child who's um, lost their you know who has flipped their lid as Dan Siegel would say uh, if you have a child who's really acting out you want to be able to protect yourself so keep some pillows nearby um, this is an opportunity this accepting phase where you just stay present and calm sometimes they just need to let it out sometimes they need to scream sometimes they need to rage and that's okay let them let them let it out as long as they're not as long as they're safe and nobody's being hurt um reflecting emotions so your face looks angry am i getting that right you know don't assume you know for sure that they're angry you could be wrong so just say you you're, you look really like you're getting really angry right now am, am i getting that right um and I think underneath that anger, something's really bothering you. You're, you're safe with me. You can let it out. You know, just being able to reflect and then provide some of that, some of that opportunity to express themselves. Um, when the child returns to a calm state, so I say that because once the child, when the child is overstimulated, hyper aroused, is in that orange zone of the mindset mountain, if they're in that space, they're not gonna be able to hear you or learn anything from you because th that part of their brain is not functioning, right? So you really, once the child does release some of their, um, some of their feelings and they seem to be edging down to a calmer state, this typically can take up to 20 minutes. So don't expect it to happen quickly, but it will typically happen in about 20 minutes, which is like the life cycle of a panic attack really is, is about 20 minutes from, from beginning to peak to end. Um, you wanna try and wait until they are coming down and starting to feel a little more grounded and educate them with some empathy. So it's okay to feel all your emotions, even anger, we all experience them, um, you know, talk about the different feelings and how they have a purpose, that there's no good or bad feelings, that they're all human feelings. Um, you know, talk about how that anger really makes us feel powerful. Um, and and we need that, we need that feeling sometimes, but it's also emotion that covers up fear and sadness. And so, you know, I'm wondering if, if underneath all that, you're really feeling, really feeling hurt and sad. Um, so kind of educating them and you might have to do some of your own work and legwork on your end to teach your own self about how to talk about feelings but this is something that can be really powerful and then sharing and solving so i used to feel really upset when so sharing a time when you felt really upset or got really angry or flipped your lid or lost it on somebody you know share a story that when you were a kid you did this too and 
let them know that they're not alone in this, that they're not the only ones, because that's really the most painful part is that you think you're all alone. You think there's something wrong with you. You think that you're the only person in the world going through this. But when they hear you say, you know, I used to feel really scared too at nighttime, at bedtime, and, and I was so afraid of the dark. And my mom used to just tell me to go to bed and I'd stay up all night, you know, staring at the shadows, thinking that something was going to jump out and get me. And you'll be amazed at their response. They'll be fascinated that, I mean, I see it, I do it with my daughter and she's like, really mom, tell me again, tell me again about that time when you got scared too. Like she just, they just really love to hear that they're not the only one. So even with teens, you know, they tend to think too that adults have it all together and they have it all figured out, but, you know, open up and share with them a time that you messed up, a time you made a mistake and you'd be amazed at how much trust that can build between the two of you and how it helps them regulate their emotions. The more ways you can do this is increasing trust with 10 minutes of positive interactions every day. So that means not um, directing the child or judging the child or criticizing the child. It's kind of like a, a free 10 minutes of just joy and fun together, no matter the circumstances. They don't have to get anything right or be wrong. It's just like open time as long as, again, as long as they're safe and not hurting themselves or anyone else to just 10 minutes of being in their presence, watching them, observing them without criticizing, judging, or directing them in any way. Um, and if you do that for 10 minutes every day, you'll start to notice that you guys uh, in improve your relationship. Normalize the symptoms of distress and educate them about their emotions. We talked about that already. Um, get moving. So trauma lives in the body. And I haven't talked a lot about this. I could probably do a whole series on this alone, but trauma lives in our bodies. So exercise is critical. Um, getting moving, jumping on a trampoline is awesome for kids uh, to, to sort of shake up some of those um, stress hormones and get them out of the body. You really want to get moving, whether it's go for a walk, get outside, get fresh air. The sunlight can be really helpful. Um, water can be incredibly soothing. Animals, horseback riding, there's all these different ways to um, engage with your physical body because um, that's what we need to do is, is help try and, and process some of the trauma that's living in our bodies. Focus on the adequate rest before all other activities. So sleep is the priority for kids with trauma. They need, they really need their sleep more than they need to go to their sports, more than they need to do most things. Um, obviously they have to go to school, so that can become an issue, but um, sleep is really important unless you have a child who's oversleeping. Cause on some, if you're, if you're hypo aroused, you're in that very low state, you might have someone who's sleeping way too much, which case we need to try and motivate them more and actually get them moving more. Um, but oftentimes what you'll see is kids with trauma are not getting enough sleep. You really need to make that a priority for them. Their brain just can't function. Nobody's brain can function with a lack of sleep. I certainly can't. So just a reminder to focus on, on that as well. Um, another way to work on some of the trauma that's in the body is by intentionally shaking or rocking your body back and forth. So you can ask the child if they feel comfortable do, doing that and teach them that this, this is a way to help you calm down when you're upset. So rocking in a chair, sitting back and forth, even laying down on the ground and just like rocking side to side. Any kind of like side to side moment can, uh, movement can be really helpful. It can also be um, really soothing to um, cross your arms over your chest like this and tap. It's called a butterfly. Uh, butterfly tapping, and that can really send the safe and comforting message to your nervous system to calm down. So these are all a couple of things that you can do, um, suggest for the child to do with their body. Again, having spots in the home where they can go to de-escalate and ground themselves, um, not calling it time out or, or the calm down room, but just like your place, you know, your break spot, your place to take a break, place to um, relax or whatever it is, offering rocking chairs, a glass of ice water can always be really helpful to like reset the, the nervous system. Um, exercise balls, relaxing music, using a soft voice, all those things, dimming the lights, you know, turning down some of the sensory content that's coming in, um, that can all be soothing. And then of course, restorative breathing, which I'm sure you've all heard about, but there is a little bit of a different way that we wanna do it in a highly anxious state. So, and this is not just for children, but for everybody. You wanna inhale slowly. So it's not like this big deep breath, like it's not like that. It's, it's more of a slow 
breath in to count of four and then a slow exhale out to a count of six. It's really important that the exhale be longer than the inhale. If you really are feeling anxious, a great way to do it is two quick, slow inhales. So it's like, and then let out for longer. So you do two quick inhales, like quick, when I say quick, I just mean back to back, but like two slow, like short inhales and then a long exhale out. And that will also send those messages to your nervous system that it's safe. And then orientation exercises, which are grounding exercises, such as you know naming and counting the things in the room that you see, hear, feel, taste, or touch, engaging the five senses can bring you out of a dissociated state if you are in shutdown or freeze. Um, and so children, if you if you think they are dissociated, this is something that you can um, help them come back into the present moment by asking them to point out five things they can see, four things they can touch, three things they can hear, two things they can smell, one thing they can touch or taste. Some more um, trust building activities. I have I've got a lot of this stuff. <laughs> um, secret question box, so um, or passing notes, secret notes to each other. So you're allowed to say anything. You're allowed to ask anything. No topic is off limits. No words are off limits. Anything goes in the box or in the note, and um, they will remain private between you and the child. And this can just be a way for them to talk about things that they might not otherwise be able to say with words person to person, because that can be really confrontational. Another way is to speak with a child side by side instead of face to face, because face to face can feel really intimidating or scary. Um, but you know, if you're going for a walk, you're side by side, you're kind of in sync with each other, it's less confrontational. Same thing, um, riding in the car is another good time to talk because you, you know, you're sitting next to each other in the car. These are just some suggestions. Um, but being honest, we've talked a lot about that. Um, keeping their information private, do not let them overhear you sharing their private information. Even things you don't think are private could be, so just err on the side of caution and, and just don't talk about the child in front of the child. Um, require check-ins, especially for teens. I, I, I was one of those kids who mom, her mom, my mom just never needed us to check in. She never needed us to call when we got anywhere. All my friends thought it was so cool that my mom was so chill and laid back, but I was like, huh, maybe she doesn't care about me. And nobody ever thought about it from that perspective, but that's kind of how it felt. I kind of sometimes wondered if she cared where I was or what I was doing. So as much as they may seem like they're annoyed by it, I'm willing to bet that they um, actually, it makes them feel as though you care about them. Be patient and um, know that it's going to take many, many times of you being consistent and caring and compassionate and trustworthy before they will trust you. And I say this, and again, this is one of those things I really want you to perk your ears up and listen to, because as adults, we tend to think the child has to earn my trust. But in these situations with trauma, that's not how it's going to work this time. You need to earn their trust first. Because of the developmental trust and security that was taken from them, um, the foundation of 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 their life and who they are, you are going to need to be willing to earn their trust before you're going to be able to trust them. And that's just how it is. And um, if you can do that, then you'll be on your way. Um, so how can we help? Did we do this one already? Oh, some communication tips. Oh yes, we went over some of this, but you know, getting on the same level. So sitting down, if a child is is sitting down, um, keep an open posture, open arms and hands. Speak slowly and softly. Ask what happened and reflect. Don't assume that the child did something wrong. You know, get the story first before you assume you know what happened. Validate their feelings. Share their feelings. Uh, share your feelings and come up with solutions led by the child. So, okay, we don't agree on this, this, and this, but what, what, what can we agree on? You know, what would you like to see happen? Here's what I would like to see happen. Can we find some solution in the middle and let them come up with what those solutions could be? Because that's where you're going to get the buy-in. If you just tell them what the solutions are, they're not likely to pay attention or really care, or do what it is. But if they can come up with their own solutions, it's going to give them that sense of empowerment. If you can't stay calm, have a backup person. Again, that's what we talked about earlier.
So we're coming to the end of our presentation today. I hope that this was helpful to all of you out there. We had a huge audience, about 750-ish people, um, which is amazing, my biggest audience yet. I hope, I hope that this was really impactful and helpful for all of you. Um, my website is bethtyson.com. If you want to sign up for my newsletter on childhood trauma and loss, you can do so on my homepage. There's a little box that just says subscribe now and type in your email address and you will receive emails from me about updates on free resources, um, blogs that I write and different um, resources I come across that are helpful and free. I really just do all of this to help people um, and that's it for, for, for that. Um, there's videos you can look up and you can hopefully uh, have all this information on the printed out version that you bought or that you got from Michelle and Operation Parent. Um, grandfamilies.org is a great organization to learn more about um, grandfamilies and kinship care support. And of course, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and <clears throat> the Child Trauma Academy. Um, as well as looking up children's books for anxiety and trauma. The Operation Parent Handbook uh, was gifted to me and I found it to be incredibly helpful. I saved it. My daughter just started kindergarten, so she isn't quite uh, <laughs> coming into contact with some of the things in the, in the books, although the elementary one was super helpful to get me thinking about what might be coming down the road. Um, so I'm saving these and holding on to them because they are such an incredible source of information that puts all together in one book the challenges that you probably are going to face with school-age children and with teens and adolescents. Um, so it gives you guidance, really, really solid mental health resource and, and guidance for um, all different types of topics such as bullying and substance abuse, um, cell phone use, friend problems, and anything a child might struggle with during the school age years. Um, it was just, it was really insightful and, and helpful to me as a parent who's about to go through it all. <laughs> so I, um, I really recommend you getting a copy of these handbooks um, for your school or organization to give out to other parents who might be struggling with some of these issues. That's it for, for me today, guys. I'm so glad that I was able to spend this time with you. Again, please get in touch with me. You can email me or subscribe to my newsletter on bethtyson.com. I do have a Facebook page called Beth Tyson Trauma Consulting. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram, Beth Tyson Trauma Care. Uh, you can pretty much find me on all social media channels. They're also all linked at the top of my homepage at bethtyson.com. So I hope that you will come and find me. I love hearing from my audience members members and I love um, answering and giving support to anyone that I can. Beth, this was amazing. You packed so many resources in our time <laughs> together, um, even though we have been working on the presentation for a while and we've done practice runs. I'm still taking new notes of, of <laughs> things that I learned today. So thank you. You're um, welcome. So, so much. Um, I did want to just let you know there's so much gratitude um, in the uh, comments that we're getting back from people in the question section, they said, thank you, this was wonderful, um, keep doing what you're doing, and uh, it's helped them personally as well as helping us be able to help children that have gone through trauma. Thank you, um, thank you all. You bet. Okay, so we're going to go through a couple of questions. We've gotten great questions in the queue already. And then um, we're going to do the book giveaway. And you also get a Grand Sullivan stuffed koala if you are one <laughs> of them, the three winners. So we'd like to offer this um, to any grand parents that might be on uh, the presentation with us today. So what I'm going to ask you to do is right when we get to the very end, I'll have you um, enter your name and your address if you are a grandparent that is um, with us to the very end of the presentation. We'll have you enter your information then. Um, okay, and then I'm going to just tell folks um, if you have a question, now is a great time to put it in the queue. I'm going to tell folks a couple more things about Operation Parent and then we will dive into just a couple of questions. Um, we have our individual parent handbook available at Operation Parent. 
there's an elementary version, um, which we featured uh, more this time than we ever have before. And so hopefully you've started to get a flavor of the elementary handbook. Um, and what we did want to mention is in the elementary handbook, there's a section on mental health, um, as well as the section right prior to that are um, some information on coping skills, which is also a really great read and helpful for any parent of any elementary school um, child. You can order those on operationparent.org. Uh, you can order an individual copy or you can also do a bulk order um, up on our website. We also have a very special offer this time. This is uh, not one that we do very many times a year, actually only a couple times a year. Um, it's buy one, get one free. So if you're interested in checking out any of our handbooks today, today is a really great time. Actually now all the way through April the 7th, um, you can go onto our website and enter uh, the coupon code SHARE1. Um, you know, hope is at the core of our mission, Beth, and we believe that our handbooks can empower parents and instill hope by providing really up-to-date information and tips on how to support youth. We are um, committed to reaching more parents each time we do a webinar. So we've um, done webinars for four years and um, we have a great audience, a uh, large audience with us today, a huge following from your home state of Pennsylvania, which is really exciting. Um, you brought a lot of new attendees and your hometown uh, with you to this presentation. <laughs> um, but like I said, we're committed to reaching more parents. And we have just recently gotten to the place where we are able to offer free shipping on all of our orders. Um, okay. Our team is hoping that participants today might buy one for your family, but maybe also consider um, gifting the free copy to a family who is um, in need of the information. And so again, you can go to our website and just use the coupon code SHARE1 and you are able to get an individual handbook and get one for free, or you may also do a bulk offer. So if you wanted, if you're an organization, a large school, um, or any organization you wanted to do a bulk order, uh, the buy one, get one free deal uh, does apply. So we encourage you to, to check that out. We also have um, staff that could help with questions with any type of, any, any order. We're happy to help with that. Um, we mentioned our next webinar at the beginning of the presentation, and we encourage you to go ahead and register for that today so that you don't miss out on it. Carrie Stutzman is a parentologist and she's in um, <laughs> joining us to help us keep our teens talking to us. So something that we're all interested in doing and need to refine our technique. I mean, I think if you have more than one child, you know, once you get it down with one child, your younger one comes along and they're completely different. So you need a new strategy. <laughs> um, so I hope you'll join us and uh, continue to learn from Carrie Stutzman. She's putting together a wonderful presentation for us on April the 26th. All right, I've got some questions uh, pulled from the, the folks that were early entries into the question section. And so we'll start there and see uh, where it takes us. Um, okay. One of the first questions was, do you feel like a child um, will ever be able to leave the familiar type of behavior, even if this is um, not the best behavior to have when they are in a thriving, better situation? So I read that to mean like if a child is acting out or um, actually um, our attendee gave us an example or if they come from yelling. So their background was from one of yelling and that's how they're dealing with mm -hmm. things in the home. Yeah, I mean, I think it, a lot of it depends on maybe how long they were exposed to it. So um, that could be part of what might change this. But I believe that there is hope for that change with consistency and with therapy and with help and support. Um, I think that we can help children heal from that. I think it might take longer than you would ever imagine. 
Um, mm -hmm. I think you will need a lot of patience for that to take place. And of course, there's no guarantee, but there's always hope that 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 can be worked upon. There's all different types of therapy for children. Um, I didn't go through that today, but I think it's a really critical part of this that if you if your child is not open to talk therapy, which a lot of times they aren't or it just doesn't work, try there's many different types of therapy to try. So there's EMDR therapy is especially helpful for um, for trauma. There's um, play therapy. There's um, there's trauma focused therapy, um, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, there's all these different forms. So just because there's art therapy, just because you may have taken your child to therapy once and it didn't seem to be helpful, keep trying and keep trying until you find something that does help and does work. And I do believe that as human beings, we, we all can change. Our brains are malleable until we die, even though they're less so the older we get. Um, even even people in their 90s are still able to change and their brains are still changing. So there's always hope. Always, 100%. Yep, and you remind us of that in so many ways today. Um, for a trauma, a triggered child that has explosive behaviors and it's traumatizing for other siblings, mm -hmm. what, what do you offer as help for other siblings in the home? Yeah. So that's one area that really there isn't a lot of support for right now. And I, I know that can be really tough, but, um, and I think it's like a population that we've really just totally forgotten about, like the other kids in the home that are being exposed mm -hmm. to it. So that's, um, that's a really great question and also a really hard one to answer. But I think, you know, helping them if they're old enough, I don't know the ages of the children, but if they are old enough to become trauma informed and trauma sensitive and responsive, that can really help them at least understand where the behaviors are coming from and will change the dynamic of the relationship at least a little bit. You know, they might be able to find some empathy or understanding for what the other child is going through. Um, but also you really want to support the child, the sibling who is experiencing the other child's behavior is traumatic, you really want to help support them too with, with the same amount of, ther of therapy and self-care and exercise and good sleep hygiene and nutrition. And, you know, you really need to treat them, you know, in, in the same type of way that you would treat a child with trauma because they're going through it too and they're also being taxed. So um, it's a hard situation and my heart goes out to you for that. Um, yeah, it's really hard. And what are, this isn't a question, but um, something I have on my mind, like what are some resources for foster and adoptive parents and um, those with us today that for self-care, like taking care of, of themselves, what oh, do yeah. you recommend and what, what have you seen um, help, help parents get through everything they're trying to manage and sort through? The most important thing is not to isolate yourself. So relationships heal. It's just like the relationships heal the child with trauma, they also will be healing to you. So do not isolate yourself. Force yourself, if you have to, to have some sort of communication with somebody that you're close with on a regular basis, someone you can call. Um, maybe it's a regular Sunday brunch that you get together, but make that time and make it a priority. I know that can be really hard to do when you're raising children. Um, you feel like you don't have any time, but you have to choose at least a few things for yourself or else you won't be able to take care of anybody else. So having a support system, I'm actually, I, I, we didn't talk about it earlier, but I work for an organization called Grand Stepping Up. They are a, um, a nonprofit organization for grandparents raising their grandchildren, and it's it's a support system. They've become like an extended family to me. I'm not a grand family, but they've included me as though I am, and I'm proud to be there, and I feel like I have a bunch of grandmothers for my daughter who, you know, is missing one of hers, so it's a win-win. Um, but really getting involved in your community, a support group of some kind, there are kinship support groups out there. There are foster care support groups. You can find them all over the place on, on, online and, or in person now that COVID has sort of, you know, released us all back out into the world a little bit. Um, so yeah, do, that's the number one thing that's going to help you through this. Great cool. suggestion. Really great. Um, and, you know, probably easier said than to do, but so important to just make that time for sure. Um, okay, I loved, I might have loved this question the most. 
Um, the question is how are, no, sorry, are there professionals like you all over the country? <laughs> and, and what might their um, titles be? And yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yes, there are. Um, they are harder to come by, um, but you really, so you would want to look for a um, trauma informed psychotherapist or counselor um, who focuses on trauma. Some of the titles you, this, some of the types of things you can search for are trauma focused CBT. That's trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy or therapists. So you could look up them. You can look up emdria.org, emdria.org, and that will give you a list of national EMDR therapists that you can seek out. And they are all trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive. They do work with children, and it's a highly effective form of therapy for trauma. Um, I'm actually trained in it, but I'm not practicing it right now. <laughs> so... Uh, so I know a lot about it, but yes, you can find professionals. It's not as easy, but there are um, places you can look. Um, Paces Connection will be a really big resource for families. Um, that's the organization that really connects everybody, you know, all the professionals and the caregivers and the people that are interested in adverse childhood experiences. And so go to pacesconnections.org and you'll find a wealth of information there to, to That's support perfect. you. And I wanted to remind our audience too of the handouts that we shared with you are from Paces. Um, so we're you know grateful to have that information on the handouts as well. But just as a tip, you can go to that handout and look um, exactly how they, they spell it and mm -hmm. uh, their contact information's on there. Um, okay, so um, speaking of professional organizations and just support for professionals who are working with families, um, how do we keep ourselves safe and grounded when working with children and families of trauma? So that mm -hmm. was a question from a, a professional that's um, on with us today. Yeah, another tough one. Um, you know, secondary trauma is real. Um, it's also known as vicarious trauma. So, um, it's important to be in your own therapy. Honestly, when I was in training, um, that's what I was taught. And I think that's the most valuable thing you can do that you should, you should just kind of continuously be in therapy and supervision. Um, you, you know, having a good supervisor can really help you with a lot of that or should be helping you through some of that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that it can be traumatizing. You wanna know what the symptoms of secondary trauma are. So you can look those up. If you notice any of those symptoms, you know, it might be time for you to take a break or get extra support, go to therapy, talk to your supervisor, um, you know, make sure that you're turning up your, your um, self-care stuff. And I know self-care is such a buzzword right now. I'm not crazy about it, but basically it means like, you know, taking good care of yourself, not just your outward self, but your inward self. So finding time to um, create a mindfulness practice or finding that time to exercise or do art or go to a support group um, or do therapy, like those are all things that are, are self-care. It's not just getting your hair done and your nails done. It's, you know, it's, it's really about taking care of your inside self. So, um, so yeah, reading books can be really helpful um, on the topic and just familiarizing yourself with what secondary trauma is so that you know what the signs to look for. And um, again, that, that peer support is really, is really what's gonna get you through. It's an awesome way to look at it. Thank you so much um, for that advice. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do one last question and then I'm gonna go over a couple of housekeeping things because we had a lot of um, questions about particulars in our follow-up after okay. the webinar. So I'm going to hit that at the end. Um, so how, last question, how do we help a teen or child who doesn't want to talk but suffers from extreme anxiety? Mm. Um, that's going to be with the body, you know, if they're not willing to talk, and which a lot of kids aren't, that's why EMDR therapy can be really helpful because it's not a lot of talking. It's actually, um, it stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And a lot of what happens is internal. And it's a, um, a process where they're moving their eyes back and forth quickly like this while they're thinking about and sort of desensitizing themselves to some of the trauma and the, and the therapist guides them through it, but they're not actually um, 
they don't have to share everything. They don't have to keep regurgitating the story over and over again, which can be really hard and upsetting. So um, that's from a therapy standpoint, but from like, if it's just your, if you're a caregiver or a teacher or something like that, if they're not willing to talk about it, then maybe they're willing to draw about it. Maybe they're willing to express themselves through art. Maybe they're willing to express themselves through play. If it's a younger child or even an older child um, with uh, like, give them some, some figurines of family, members like you know a mom and a dad and some kids in a house and see what they do with it you might not understand what they're doing but they could be acting out some of the trauma that they've been through because children process their uh, emotions through play so that's for you know young, you know younger children even children who might be older chronologically but developmentally younger this could work for them as well um, so don't rule out the fact that just because they're 15 at developmentally they're 15 they could be 12 you know in their in their emotions and their minds um even though on the outside they're 15 so um mm -hmm. also uh writing you know writing stories creative writing might be an outlet maybe it's not writing specifically about what happened to them maybe they're writing about other things but it comes out through their writing they don't even realize it you know so you kind of music music can be a really really awesome way for kids to work out um, their trauma and loss, or there's music programs. Um, uh, horseback riding, horses are incredibly therapeutic, especially for kids with trauma. There are organizations across the world or across the country that uh, offer equine assisted trauma therapy. So if you have an animal lover, um, you know, that can be a way for them to um, process what they've been through. So dogs, animals, any type of, um, of relationship that maybe isn't human, will be less threatening and helps them build attachment and helps them heal. So there's, there's, you want to, and then focusing on the body. So the movement, the exercise, the, the shaking, the rocking, um, the tapping, you can look up EFT tapping um, for them. Um, all these things, you don't have to talk about any of it. You can just do, and that might be easier. Yeah, that's really, it's really neat. All the different ways that you've suggested that, because um, every child is so different. And I loved that encouragement that you gave us. If something doesn't work, don't stop. Keep, keep trying. trying, right? <laughs> I love that so much. Um, so I, I said that that was going to be our last question, but I, I, I have one. I have one more. Um, someone had asked us to go back to the theory that you've developed about mapping triggers by the season. And yeah. that uh, prompted me to think it would be great to go back there if Nikki's able to and just let folks take a picture of that um, slide yeah. in case they wanted it for future reference, because just remembering that um, seasons have triggers and uh, to be thinking proactively ahead um, yes. on some of those things or, you know, now we might recognize when something happens mm -hmm. based on that theory that you came up with and, and uh, shared with us. So yeah. if you're interested, yeah, please um, take a picture of this and, and have it on your phone and um, think about it a little bit more mm -hmm. when you have some time. Yeah, for example, like the spring, this time of year can be triggering for everybody because of the, it was when the pandemic started. So like when it started to get warm out and like we started um, writing with chalk in the driveway with my daughter, those were all things that we did right um, in March of 2020 and like it brought up all these mm -hmm. feelings in me you know like just memories and feelings that I had back then and the fear that I had now I wasn't like tossed into a complete trigger panic over it and that might might not be the case that you might not like go into a full you know triggered response trauma response but you still the feelings they get closer to the surface even if they're not having a big dramatic expression. So just being aware, you know, be a little more gentle, be a little more compassionate. If you're noticing, be a little more patient. If you're noticing um, that this time of year is tough for your children, you know, it's bringing up some, some really big emotions and some sad memories. For sure. I mean, you're 100% right. Even I'm sure on, um, I guess, pictures started to pop up memories um, mm -hmm. on, you know, social media and things of this time of year when the pandemic, um, when lockdown really started to happen. Um, yeah, that brought brought back some emotion and memories and that it's a, a good way to think about um, supporting children that yeah. have gone through very traumatic things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and just that, you know, for us, even 
um, experiencing that seasonally with the review of the pandemic, that's that's a good reminder for each of us personally of what that would be like to yeah, transfer that. Exactly. That's why I wanted to point that out because it's something we all can relate to. So you might not be having a full trauma response, but the same way that you're noticing the, the things that are tipping you off to remind, remind you of when the pandemic started, that's exactly what happens to children when they get triggered um, mm -hmm. by their traumatic experiences. It's these little things that you nobody else might really notice or that they might not even be sure it comes from, but it creates an emotional response. 100%, yes. Um, we were also asked what, what could um, schools do to help and it reminded me of one of our ideas that we came up with was that um, just having your book available to read in the classroom mm -hmm. would make um, classmates more sensitive to what a foster or adoptive um, child might be going through. Yeah. Which then could then potentially maybe lessen if there were um, some bullying type situations. So I know I'm, I'm making a leap there. But, um, we, you know, we thought it's, it would be so good for more children just to be exposed um, to your book and um, the thought process of how to support a classmate who is um, in a foster home or an adoptive home or yeah. any family type that might be different than um, what that individual child is um, placed in or grown up in. Yeah, I think it's it shows... Uh, you know, the book itself is, you know, it's, it was written as a therapeutic tool um, for families, but it also as a side, <laughs> as a, a side benefit that I wasn't planning on originally is that it builds empathy for other kids who might not be in that exact situation, but know somebody who is. And so instead of bullying or teasing that child, oh, why is your mom so old or whatever, <laughs> you know, kids can say crazy things. Um, if they see a grandparent always picking up the child. Um, maybe if they've been exposed and have an awareness that all families are different and that this is one of the family constellations that are out there, one of the larger populations, it's the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing populations in our country is grandparents raising grandchildren. So um, I know everybody I talk to knows somebody who's a grand family. Um, so it's, it's, it's much more prevalent than we realize. And um, if we can create and increase some empathy for those families by using this book with um, classrooms and and teachers and things, it, it could be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we work with a lot of uh, community coalitions all over the country. And um, as part of our work here locally, we are encouraging public libraries in our area to purchase the book and have available for grand families as um, as well as um, hopefully just anyone who's interested in reading um, the, on reading your great book as well as supporting a child through trauma. Um, so that might be an idea for anyone who's still on um, and works in a community coalition setting uh, to have it have encourage public libraries to have it available for families um, yeah. as well. It's great for, um, for well, I'm a CASA volunteer, so it's great for CASA organizations, court appointed special advocates is what that stands for, and also social workers. That's where I really got this idea was when I was working with the child welfare department. So I wanted, I needed a book to go and speak to these families and help them kind of help the children understand what they're going through because nobody was talking about it. And it was my job to tell them. <laughs> yeah. my job yeah. I was like ah, uh, how do I say this you know and the book mm -hmm. is a bridge yeah. it's a tool it's a way to a child's heart um, in words when you just don't have the words when you need somebody to help you find the words absolutely words stuff. yeah I mean we we're sure thankful that you made the shift and uh, took that calling on to write the book um, it, it is certainly opening up a lot of doors um, for families, you know, just to be supported. So we're super thankful of that. And if you're a grand family, a grandparent who's still on here with us and you're raising a child, I um, invite you now to go ahead and put your first and last name and your address um, in the question section. And we will be so happy uh, to send you 
a copy, well, Beth will, a copy of her <laughs> book, as well as she had the idea to add a um, stuffed Sullivan koala bear uh, for the child that, that you love um, in your life. So I, yeah, I apologize. We, we only have three of those. So it'll be the first three who enter uh, will be our winners. And then I did say I wanted to hit on a couple of housekeeping things because we've gotten a lot of questions about um, when the recording will be available. And um, you will receive that as an attachment um, in, an, in a follow-up email tomorrow. So you're definitely going to receive the recording. Um, if you've been live with us uh, for the presentation, you're also going to receive a certificate um, so I know many of you who are, are foster families are interested um, in that certificate. So please know that it is on the way for sure. If you happen to be a family that's viewing this um, after the live session, uh, you know, we'll be happy to um, distribute a certificate once you fully viewed uh, the presentation. And then um, we had one more idea with this content because we knew that it was going to resonate uh, with families so strongly that we're going to offer uh, Beth's presentation as a rebroadcast on April the 21st at 7.30. Um, so that is, um, you're going to have the recording if you're with us today, but that thought was more so that you could share it with fellow foster families or if you know um, a professional social worker or a teacher uh, or someone, anyone who you might know that might be interested and would benefit from the content that you could invite them to register for the rebroadcast. Um, so it will it will be a replay of and a recording of, of the uh, work today, but we did want more families to have the opportunity to, um, to view it and especially if you're a uh, foster family who may need a certificate for your continuing education. Uh, we hope that, that that might be helpful. All right. Well, um, we've gotten to as many questions as we can today. If we missed your question, I do apologize for that. Um, I did want to let anyone who's still with us know, as well as you, Beth, we had some trouble getting your camera up. Um, during the presentation itself. No, no. So, okay. Shucks, I wanted to just let the audience know that that wasn't part of our plan. Um, it was just a tech snafu kind of thing. And so I wanted to apologize for you for that, as well as the audience. We, we did everything we could um, to try and, and get it up. And obviously it's working now. And we, um, <laughs> Your, your presence on camera is as equally as great as the presentation. So that wasn't our, our plan going into it. So I apologize that you guys could not see Beth um, through the entire presentation, uh, but at least you got a good good look at her at the end during the question section. <laughs> um, <laughs> so forgive us for that. We're, we're yeah. human and we tried it as many ways as we could and we just couldn't, couldn't get oh, it. That's so strange. That's too bad. I did see the box pop up and it was like, host is asking you to share your webcam and I clicked on it and then it was fine I guess yeah. uh, how long was it off for a long time uh yeah for yeah. the whole up until like the entire presentation uh Aww. sorry and no and no we not, just cut. not about me it's about the content yeah. so well we would you have could preferred still hear me, right? we could hear you perfectly we that's just couldn't that. see you the whole time which no, uh, that's fine but everyone's look was looking forward to that. So we we apologize for that. Just wanted you to know wasn't part of the original plan. Yeah. Um so but everything else went just as planned and smooth as pie. And uh yeah. just thank you so much for your time and talent, Beth. And thank you everybody. We know that your time is valuable. You've spent extra time um with us today on this presentation, which I am so thankful for. And um, hopefully you'll continue to join us for future presentations. Everybody yes. have a, a great rest of your afternoon and we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you again, Beth. See you Thank soon. You, Michelle. Okay, bye-bye. Alrighty, bye-bye.